By the end of the 1800s, U.S. expansion was nearly complete as white settlers and African Americans moved on to former native lands. This seemingly unstoppable growth posed a problem harder and harder to ignore. What was to be done with the Native Americans? Our relations with the Indians located within our border impose upon us responsibilities we cannot escape. Every effort should be made to lead them through the paths of civilization and education to self-supporting and independent citizenship. In 1883, Construction began on Shalako Indian Agricultural School, the first federal boarding school in Indian Territory, later to become Oklahoma. Established under a federal policy of assimilation, Shalako embraced what was then a popular notion that Native Americans must abandon their tribal ways to flourish. The students who passed through Shalako's gates for the next hundred years would prove that notion wrong, maintaining their native identities and cultures even as they learned new skills. Their stories help illuminate Shalako's complex legacy and its importance to a larger history of U.S. Native boarding schools. Shalako was built on over 8,000 acres on the former Cherokee Strip, not far from the Kansas border. Early recruitment efforts focused on Southern Plains tribes in South Central Oklahoma over a hundred miles from its campus. The school deliberately avoided enrolling students from nearby tribes, afraid they would run away. It was not uncommon for students to be rounded up in surprise visits to their homes and forced to attend the school against their will. When students arrived at Shalako in the early days, often by wagon, uh, so the first superintendent would go out to Cheyenne, Kiowa, Arapaho, they would bring students back Students were divested of their what were called home clothes. They were issued, government issued GI clothing and uniforms, often numbered, scrubbed down usually with kerosene. Uh, the idea was to kill lice. Shalako was modeled after Carlisle Indian School, established five years earlier in Pennsylvania. The school was founded by Captain Richard Henry Pratt, a veteran of the U.S. Indian Wars. Perhaps best known for the phrase, Kill the Indian, save the man, Pratt favored isolating Native youth from their tribal communities into boarding schools run along strict military lines. Unlike some of his peers, however, he believed in the basic humanity of Native peoples and their ability to contribute to the larger society. So his idea at Carlisle was to provide that kind of opportunity for Native people to learn white society, to learn trades, to learn a profession. The goals of Carlisle, Shalako, and other boarding schools fit neatly with the 1887 Dodge General Allotment Act. Named for the senator who oversaw it, the Dawes Act broke apart collectively held native lands into individual allotments, opening millions of acres of so-called surplus land to non-Indians. The Dawes Act weakened native communal ties, promoting a Western-style individualism. As the only Indian boarding school with a stated agricultural focus, Shalako would excel at teaching Euro-American farming techniques. By 1905, the campus had expanded to include 35 buildings, almost completely run by student labor. Congressional appropriations were never sufficient to cover costs, so that student labor was absolutely essential to both building the schools and then maintaining them, keeping them running, feeding the student body. Even when Shalako was a high school in the 30s, that might have been the equivalent of sixth, seventh, possibly eighth grade education in the public schools at that time. As at Carlisle, Shalako's early administrators sought obedience and conformity through a military regimen. Students were organized in companies that marched in double file from place to place, and their routine half-day of academics and half-day vocational training was punctuated by 22 bugle calls. Shalako was a physically tough environment. There was incarceration in what they called the guardhouse, uh, bread and water rations. There was disciplinary techniques like making somebody stand at attention for hours, in formation. Girls would talk about sometimes somebody would faint. 
What we have to remember about the schools is that there was a particular federal agenda, erase and replace Indianness, but the school was populated by human beings who were smart, tough, in many cases, resilient, intelligent, determined to be individual people. Certainly they went through many traumas uh, and, and great diversity of experience. Ironically, the Cherokee, Creek, Seminole, Choctaw, and Chickasaw, who occupied the bulk of Indian territory, were not allowed to send students to the school. Most early enrollment came from the newly created Oklahoma Territory. Only in 1910, three years after Oklahoma and Indian Territory became one state, were students from the five tribes admitted. By this time, however, Native students from throughout the country were already attending Shilako. Some were heritage language speakers with limited or no English. Others came to Shilako as English, as a first language speakers. Some came to Shilako by the 1920s from a second or third generation enrollment in boarding schools. Some came in as second or third generation Baptists or Catholics. Others came from native ceremonial religious traditions. Some students who had not been raised in those Christian traditions were quite resistant to that. There were underground practices of native religious traditions at Shalako. Students had a very elaborate communication system, passing notes, a highly developed slang, uh, kind of their own little language. In the early days of Shalako, student friendships were crucial for surviving a tough environment. Students joined together along complex lines of kinship, shared language and tribal affiliation, and notions of mixed or full-blood identity. Those were important categories to Shalako students, and that sorted the way people got along or didn't get along. Alums talk about Shalako as, you know, this very interesting ground where people met folks they would, native people they wouldn't have otherwise met. Enduring friendships, some enduring hostilities, a lot of marriages across tribal lines there. Shilako classes followed a traditional academic schedule, but students would often remain on campus all year round. Some participated in the outing program, which sent native students to work for white families on farms or in cities over the summer. Other students stayed on the grounds as laborer farmers to help run Shilako summer operations. Because Indian boarding schools purposely isolated native children from their homes, when students became ill, families were rarely informed. When students passed away at Shilako, their relatives often received only a form letter with the news that their child had died. According to federal records, 69 students are buried in the cemetery on the Shilako grounds. Well, I think we can all imagine how difficult it was for families, for parents and loved ones to see their children, their grandchildren, their nieces and their nephews taken away from them for extended periods of time. Some parents resisted. Other parents saw schools like Shilako as at least some kind of opportunity for an education that might help their children in the world. In 1928, Congress received a copy of the Merriam Report, a commissioned assessment of federal Indian policy. The report focused on the damage of forced assimilation on every aspect of Native life, including Indian boarding schools. Dozens of schools were named for unsanitary living conditions, overcrowding, and inadequate food. Testimony of physical and sexual abuse would not emerge until decades later. Shilako is not mentioned with the worst of these charges, though clearly it too offered harsh punishments, regimentation, and an inferior education. In 1934, Commissioner of Indian Affairs John Collier would respond to this report with the Indian Reorganization Act. This act sought to ease native land loss from allotment, restore tribal self-governance, and make Indian education more friendly to native cultures. Many of these reforms, along with changes suggested by the Merriam Report, were already making their way through Shilako under Superintendent Ellie Carell. When I think of Shalako, I think of Ellie Carell. 
And I think he was sincere in, in building character and excellence in those students. Carell, a former agriculture teacher, became superintendent of the school in 1926. He replaced harsh punishments and regimentation with a more humanistic approach. Accessible and fair-minded, he is said to have known each Shalako student by name, even after campus enrollment reached 1,000. Education now covered four years of high school, but Shalako's academics continued to trail public schools. Courses were often rudimentary to accommodate non-English speakers, and young women were guided toward classes that prepared them to be wives and mothers. I wish that they had a better educational system. When I went to Shalako, there was no homework, and I was used to homework, and I even asked the teacher, I said, is there something else I can do to, in the evening, like read a, read a book or something? I was in the old age whenever they were still separating boys and girls subjects. The girls couldn't take higher math because that was a boys' class. We got the credentials of being educated, <laughs> even if we didn't get the education of it. The Merriam Report called for less vocational emphasis in boarding schools, but Correll, a passionate agrarian, disagreed. He turned Shalako into a premier agricultural school, instituting a plot program which let students grow and sell their own crops. Correll's alma mater, Oklahoma A&M in Stillwater, sent instructors to help with classes in horticulture and crop treatment, but influence ran both ways. Correll's program of soil and erosion control perfected by Shalako students, was later adopted by Oklahoma A&M. I was not an agriculture student, but the Shalako grads who majored in agriculture were probably 50% ahead of any farmer you want to pick out there who's farming right now. They, they knew more, they could probably made more money on their farm than their neighbors. Shalako's large-scale animal production was an important factor in the meals served at the school. Dairy cows raised by students were used to improve dairy herds throughout Kansas and Oklahoma. A Morgan horse breeding program started by the school became the biggest of its kind in the world. Not all vocational classes were connected to farming. A school catalog from the 30s lists 45 vocational offerings from auto mechanics to construction. From its earliest beginnings, Shalako had connected vocational work not just with school operations, but with real jobs that existed outside its walls. One of the trades I thought was very uh, progressive was printing. They had a uh, linotype operator. Of course, that's old stuff, but you had to have that if you're going to have a print shop. And there were a lot of guys who uh, took printing. You print, we, they printed our papers, the little Shalako journals that we had. Shalako's enrollment rose considerably after World War I. Additional employees were hired and new buildings and programs added. Student social life also improved during this period. Whenever they could be outside, students would go fishing in the school lake, make small fires and parch corn, maybe organize a stomp dance or drum practice. In this more supportive environment, Several Native American clubs were started and powwows were held. The one thing that I remember is that we had fun. I've heard stories about Indian schools quite to the contrary. And it must have been miserable for some of those early students. It was like heaven to us. Sports were the dominant extracurricular activity at Shalako, championed by Ellie Correll, who praised their health benefits and character building. Students played football, baseball, basketball, tennis, and later, golf. Shalako boxers were among the best in the nation. The team made several appearances at the Chicago World's Fair and won numerous Golden Glove matches. Shalako women participated in intramural basketball, there was a pep squad and marching band that accompanied teams to games. By the 1940s, thanks to a vigorous recruitment program, 
Shalako's student body was made up of tribes from as far away as Alaska. There were still cliques and tribal rivalries, but the intertribally shared experience of boarding school helped bind students together and paved the way for Native activism in the 50s and 60s. Shalako had high standards, and they taught you those standards. And they had all the different tribes to come together and live together and get along and learn about each other and make friends with each other. Shalaka was unique among Indian schools in having its own National Guard Center. Company C was established in 1925 with 75 students and one non-Indian officer. The school's World War II duty began on September 16, 1940, when Oklahoma's 45th Division was mobilized. Students saw action in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, where 35 Shalakoans lost their lives, including Henry Nolatubby, the first American Indian killed in the war. Shalako produced two Medal of Honor winners during World War II, Lieutenant Ernest Childers, Muskogee Creek, and Lieutenant Jack Montgomery, Cherokee. During the Korean War, Shalakowin served in the 279th Infantry of the 45th Thunderbird Division. Known as Charlie Company, this primarily Native division was allowed to have its own mascot. During one of the uh, parades, the division commander that saw it ordered the rubber doll to be taken off that guide on. But one of the battalion commander, uh, the regimental commander rather, went to bat on behalf of Company C and eventually talked the division commander into allowing this rubber doll mascot to stay on this guide on. So it went through the Korean War. It was honored by retirement and enshrined in bronze and is now in the museum, the 45th Division Museum in Oklahoma City. Although Charlie Doll was a stereotypical image of Indianness, in the hands of Shalako soldiers, it became a symbol of resistance, a proclamation by real Indians that they were ready for the fight. We can point to almost 70% of our male students, our veterans, having joined the armed forces at one point in their life. When you look at this figure and then you see the number of females who have joined the military, then Shalako made a vast contribution. In 1969, another report on Indian education, the Kennedy Report, was released. The picture for Native students in boarding schools and public schools was grim. Hostile treatment from non-Native principals and teachers, high dropout rates, and lower achievement levels. Yet despite these findings, the report asserted that Indian boarding schools could lead the way in Native education by adapting to Native student needs. Fitting programs to students was a key goal of Jim Baker, who was appointed superintendent of Shalako in 1973, the only Shalako graduate to hold that post. His extensive background in higher education and experience as a former student led to important changes at the school. Nowhere in Oklahoma has a year-round program ever been carried out. Shalako was the first. This allowed some students to come in and attend classes 12 months out of the year. And if they did this, you know, beginning with their freshman year, then they could technically graduate in three years. The other changes that we instituted had to do with opening up our system so that students had the freedom to select a program that they maybe wanted to try. A good example of that was opening up our vocational programs to both boys and girls. You know, we allowed girls to enroll in auto mechanics, vocational agriculture, Despite curricular improvements, enrollment numbers at the school had already been on the decline for years. A lot of the tribes who had been seeing their students from Arizona and Alaska and up in the Northwest 
were better able financially to educate them at home. And of course, that's what they wanted to do. So we didn't have as many coming. Social problems in the larger society, including drug and alcohol abuse, also impacted the school. Times had just changed everywhere, but mostly after I went back there, they were hardship uh, placements. Kids that were not functioning well in the places where they were, who were in some uh, trouble, considered relatively minor at the time where they could have a better opportunity. But it was not the same. It was very, very different. And I was uh, saddened when I went back. And, but there were some wonderful students there. You know, they were just fewer and fewer and fewer. And of course, the cost per student was just out of sight. Meanwhile, Congress was looking at budget cuts in the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which drew up a list of boarding schools for possible closure. Oklahoma Senator Henry Bellman pushed for Shalako to be added to the list, alarming not just the school, but tribal and state leaders. Residents of nearby towns who worked at Shalako or did business with it also voiced their objections. But more than a few area farmers supported the closing, seeing the school as an economic competitor. If you have the partnership with an institution like Oklahoma State University that is helping you maybe do some testing with, let's say, wheat. It eventually gets its own name, and then <clears throat> you sell your wheat for $3.50 a bushel, and then the local farmer is only able to get $2.50 a bushel. Then, you know, it becomes a subject. As closing rumors gained strength, Baker took action on several fronts. To address cost and safety concerns over aging buildings, renovations were started, including the conversion of a former boys' dormitory into a multi-purpose classroom, kitchen, and dining space. Most of the remodeling was done by faculty, employees, and students, including several young women newly enrolled in construction classes. But in 1980, Shalako was forced to close, despite protests, petitions, and a Save Our School campaign by students and alumni. Support for federally run native boarding schools was no longer there, and Congress and the public were more aware of boarding school harms. Ironically, the very success of Shalako helped usher in these changes. The ability of its graduates to earn a good living gave them more choices than previous generations in where their children were raised and educated. I think that it was uh, what the doctor ordered for that era of Indian citizens all across America because it was filling a need among Indian youth with its ability to produce a self-motivated and qualified uh, trades person. I don't know of anyone who left Shalako and uh, didn't achieve something, something worthwhile. Shalako did not just graduate vocational talent. Countless alumni went on to specialized training or higher education, becoming tribal administrators, accountants, business people, nurses, counselors, and teachers. Six years after Shalako's closure, the Ka, Tonkawa, Pawnee, Ponca, and Oto Missouri nations were designated trustees of the school. Parts of the campus were leased to different organizations over the years, but campus buildings, once known for their stately beauty and grandeur, declined. Unfortunately, uh, the Shalako campus today is not what we had hoped it would be. And I say this with sometimes tears in my eyes because the campus today is uh, you know, it's, it's crumbling. So when you see all of this, you know, you ask yourself, why, what could I do, what can I do? Since 2006, Shalago's campus has been listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Restoring and preserving key buildings and perhaps the creation of a cultural center and Charlie Company Museum are among the goals of the Shalako National Alumni Association. 
The association, made up of regional chapters from around the country, holds regular business meetings, publishes a newsletter, and maintains a time-honored tradition begun in 1894, the annual Shalako reunion. Today's reunion activities include a veteran's breakfast and powwow. But the kickoff for the reunion is always a walk through the Shalako Arch. When I first arrived at Shalako, I guess the impression that I immediately noted was a walk from the arch. This is a landmark that is forever burned into my heart, is that arch. You know, you come to uh, see the place and it stirs up old memories of this and that. And a lot of the buildings are gone or, and are almost ruined, but memories remain. It, it was a huge part of my life and uh, I was able to learn some good lessons here. It, it was a good experience. They ha it had its, its bad moments, but that's life. I tend to remember about this place just as much as the good times as the bad. So it's a part of my life, so it has to be important, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I can't define it. <laughs> At its founding, Shalako was known as the light on the prairie for the kerosene lights that shone from its windows after dark. When electricity arrived in the 1930s, pilots on night flight training used the brightly lit campus to guide them to and from base. Like those pilots, many of Shalako's alumni have been guided through their lives by friendships and opportunities they gained at the school. The lights of Shalako still shine in their hearts as they work to preserve its story for generations to come. <laughs>